Our second speaker, Daniel Levy, is the president of the U.S. Middle East Project, a nonprofit which emphasizes the Palestinian-Israel issue alongside regional conflicts, trends, and geopolitics. He formerly served as director for the Middle East and North Africa at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Before that, he was a senior fellow and director of the New America Foundation's Middle East Task Force in Washington, D.C. Levy was a senior advisor in the Israeli Prime Minister's office and to the Justice Minister during the government of Barak. He was a member of the official Israeli delegation to the Israel-Palestine peace talks at Taba under Barak and at Oslo B under Yitzhak Rabin. In recent months, he has been providing invaluable commentary on what is happening in Israel. Daniel will have to leave early, so we won't have him around for a Q&A, but we're very pleased to have him now, and I will gladly give him the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure you can hear me. I've, I've lost my view of the podium for some reason. Um, but yeah, if no one says anything, I'm going to assume that uh, everyone's hearing me okay. So thank you, Mick. Uh, thank you, Manu and Claire and Mark, the organizers. And um, thank you, Francesca. And those of you who have taken your Tuesday evening to, to attend this. So given um, what Francesca covered, I will not go into what is immediately going on in the ground and the implications for international law. Um, Francesca has, has covered those things. I will say that the day I spent listening to the South African presentation at the International Court of Justice uh, on the potential violations of the Genocide Convention, which led to the provisional measures and the case moving forward, um, that was one of the saddest days uh, that I have gone through personally. Um, to think that that state is committing those crimes and is trying to undermine those conventions, given how those conventions, the context in which the Genocide Convention came about, um, filled me with despair. And Francesca, reading your report on the anatomy of a genocide, uh, brought me back to exactly that same uh, headspace. Now, what I thought I'd do is share five observations with you uh, on where we are, and then just almost do a shopping list of, of some thoughts that I've jotted down, uh, given the space that you're in, and the policy implications potentially. Um, and let me start by saying that I think the idea of how did, would one prevent a recurrence of what happened on o October 7th is not only a legitimate question to ask, it's a necessary uh, question to ask. However, if I were to answer that question, then the part that dismantling Hamas plays in the answer to that question, and even the part of how did Israel deploy itself on October 6th, what was the weight given to the Israeli Defense Force role versus the Israeli Settler Advancement and Protection Force uh, given to the role of that military? Even that, I would say, is secondary. If one does not address the question of how do we get here? How can one possibly think, which isn't justifying anything, but how can one possibly think that a people denied their most basic rights and freedoms, a people denied redress for decades, of indignity, violations of international law and occupation, denied any process that could have opened up the question of why are the majority of 
Palestinians in Gaza refugees in the first place. I'm not talking about their current latest refugeehood in Rafa and elsewhere, but from 1947 to 49. And so I don't think it's a serious attempt to address Israeli Jewish security to ignore the root causes. And yet the root causes has almost become an unapproachable subject in so many policy circles in the last six months. Secondly, I would urge people to think long and hard, and I'll share my experience from Israel with you to try and bring home this point, to think long and hard about what impunity, which Francesca addressed there, what impunity has done to the political choices and calculations of Israelis and their political class. You cannot separate the absence of accountability to the journey towards ever greater extremism inside Israel until we get to a government with Ben Gvir and Smotrich, people who you don't have to, you know, accuse as they shuffle uncomfortably and make accusations back at you of being apartheidists. These people wear eradication, displacement and apartheid as a badge of pride. And yet this was normalized. No one has cut relations because these people are part of a government. No one has fundamentally revisited their relations with Israel. So impunity has been a handmaiden to extremism, and I would argue, therefore, a handmaiden to the kind of hubris and arrogance, which was a significant tr contributory factor to October 7th. And then I want to say this. I care no less about Jewish Israeli security and Jewish communal security beyond that than those who claim that they are doing right by my community by supporting Israel's actions. And so I think we have to ask ourselves, and this is perhaps parochial in a conversation to be had in other spaces, but we have to ask ourselves, is this working? Is, is the Zionist project do, doing what was written on the tin, which is this is the best guarantor for Jewish well-being globally. And whether we're looking at narrow questions of security, the balance of forces, what Israel is doing today in terms of a generation of resistance and anger and desperation and desire for revenge that this is likely to create, or if one zooms out and looks more broadly from that entire sweep of history, Nakba onwards. If this project is premised on permanently living by the sword, then something is fundamentally wrong with the project. And that's a conversation that needs to happen primarily, but not only with Israeli friends and Jewish friends. Surely there has to be a better way, and I'm convinced that there is, to guarantee a more secure, not only Palestinian future, but also Jewish future. But there's a, the, the, unfortunately, Jewish communal institutions have not cloaked themselves in glory uh, in these last six months, or indeed prior to that, in relation to these questions. But there was a chief rabbi in the country I'm speaking to you from in the United Kingdom when I grew up, Lord Emmanuel Jacobowitz. And he once said that if I did not believe that Israel could live at peace with its neighbors, that Israel had to be at war, then this whole project would be a mistake. I think that's an important lesson. And if we are to brandy about, and Francesca, you have um, had this accusation, I believe, meritlessly hurled at you. If we are to brandy about the accusation of anti-Semitism, it's such a wanton and unserious and ungrounded fashion then it's a dangerous way 
of making the issue itself meaningless. Last two comments on this. Day after. There's a lot of talk of, of the day after. Um, what can one do? And my contribution to that would be to share with you um, that, first of all, those who now say it's the time to get back to a peace process, we've got to revive the two-state effort, you're not being serious because you're not addressing the fundamental building blocks. The building blocks include what I just said about Israeli impunity. They include allowing Palestinians to choose their own leaders rather than us trying to impose those who are illegitimate and complicit on Palestinians. An attempt right now to relaunch that same peace process is an attempt to return to and refreeze a reality which is very credibly, and Francesca repeated it, been described as an apartheid reality, not just by the blue chip human rights organizations who we pay attention to when it's convenient and we ignore when it isn't, but it's also used now in the ICJ on the advisory opinion ruling by 25 different states and regional groupings in their oral presentations. This idea that we will now spend years talking about reconstruction efforts in Gaza, this has been so devastated. Let's not go to a meaningless day after conversation. And we are so far from the day after. It's often a distraction, a place to escape from addressing the urgency uh, of a ceasefire now including the very real threat that still exists of a broader regional conflagration. And my last observation is, my goodness, what an own goal this has been for Europe, I would argue. I don't think it was exactly breaking news to anyone that there is hypocrisy and uh, double standards in the world. But when it's so transparent, when the emperor is so naked in the town square, when you spent a year and a half almost standing on that preachy soapbox talking about rule of law and international law and values and the global south and the mid-level powers, surely you must join us on this issue of Russia, Ukraine. And then you failed so spectacularly. I'm not of course talking about those who did not fail this test but as a set of institutions and states failed so spectacularly when the test came with your own ally. You know, it's for you to choose who your commission presidents are, but if there's a symbol of that failure, it is in the person of Ursula van der Leyen, who will, I think, be remembered, certainly in much of the world, in her complicity and support for these atrocious crimes. So. I do just want to, if I can, maybe just throw out telegraphically, and I won't spend uh, time on any, on, on any one of these, uh, throw out telegraphically a few specifics. Um, first of all, was November really the time to create a special fund to try and do it secretly, by the way, on uh, supporting the normalization Abraham Accords? I'm not suggesting all the blame, by the way, goes with Europe. The US has its lion's share and there are states in the region who need to take a long look in the mirror. But those normalization accords, so lionized in so much of the West, were part of this marginalization and this lesson to Israel that you can get away with anything in marginalization of the Palestinian question. So what on earth are you doing creating a fund for that? Secondly, are you really still going to have a vote and discuss Palestinian textbooks? and lend credence to this idea on the Israeli side spouted by Benjamin Netanyahu that de-radicalization is a prerequisite for the rebuilding of Gaza. That's what he's saying. Um, incitement is a problem. But did you follow what was at the ICJ? One of the provisional measures to end the incitement to genocide from the top, down, left, right, everywhere starting with the president. Uh, next, as Francesca said, world central kitchen should not be there. I'm glad to see that funding has been resumed uh, for UNRWA, but let's stop playing this game that there are alternatives and let's get four square behind those uh, who can provide this. 
Next, if you don't take the ICG ser ICJ seriously on this, then why would anyone take your admonitions to follow the ICJ or international law seriously on anything else? Next, I don't know if a new facility for European armaments is going to be created, but, but I would say you should be very careful who you're using that with and sending that to. I know Israel's not on that list, but we also have seen the conspicuous absence in most spaces of ending arms transfers to Israel. Next, under what conditions will the association agreement and association councils be held in the future with Israel? Next, I don't know if people have seen this report. I highly recommend it in 972 magazine, an Israeli news website on the use of AI technology and a particular program called Lavender uh, as one of the ways of using drones and targeting in the broadest way uh, an allowance of Palestinian civilian casualties. As you increasingly find yourselves dealing with regulations around AI, remind yourselves that the dystopian future is here today, here already, we're seeing it. Maybe I should, I should draw to a close. I, I will just say this. I don't want to appear whinging or mealy-mouthed. Um, but does, does recognition of Palestine as a symbolic act without saying there are costs and consequences for the area of that recognized state that are being occupied, is that the best we can do? Is naming and shaming individual settlers the best we can do? Is even differentiation between settlement products as if those settlements and those settlers don't only exist because the infrastructure, the security, the confiscated land, the economy that they're plugged into is the Israeli economy. Is that really the best we can come up with? I think it's a rhetorical question because the idea is absolutely no, it's not the best we can come up with. So if European support is going to come with the price of continuing to be complicit in a situation which for sure cannot deliver a better tomorrow for Palestinians and offers only more devastation, but I would argue also only guarantees continued insecurity for Israel, then take your attention elsewhere. Do your best to neutralize the worst of the policy. But until we see a real rethink, I don't see how European engagement, sadly, can be helpful on this question. Thank you.